We have a crisis among young men, and it starts at a young age. Young men are twice as likely on a behavior-adjusted basis to be suspended. Seven in 10 high school valedictorians are women. For every two female graduates from college in the next five years, you only have one. The scariest stat, only one in three men under the age of 30 have had sex in the last year. We're not gonna have kids. We're not gonna have a productive society. We're gonna have more violence. We're gonna have a society that does not value young men, and they do not. The Hill Report said men in their 20s are more likely than women in their 20s to be romantically uninvolved, sexually dormant, friendless, and lonely. They stand at the vanguard of an epidemic of declining marriage, sexuality, and relationships that afflicts all of young America. In the worst case scenario, the young American man's social disconnect can have tragic consequences. Young men commit suicide at four times the rate of young women. Younger men are largely responsible for rising rates of mass shootings, a trend that some researchers link to their growing social isolation. Nearly half of all young adults are single. Now, look at these numbers. 34% of women, twice as many, a whopping 63% of men. What explains that? Why are men in such crisis? I mean, the stats are like only 40% go to college. So they're losing out to women there in a big way. And women with degrees don't marry men who right. don't have degrees. Though sparsely covered in the media, there's a silent trend that deserves our attention. A trend spanning decades of research that seems to show men are not as privileged as society has led us to believe. In this video, I'll be going over the data from three of the many categories in which men are objectively sucking at, and two solutions derived from existentialist philosophy that can help hurting men take a step in the right direction. Existentialist philosophy began in the mid-19th century in response to the rapid shortage of meaning, which I would argue is exactly what men and women are still facing today. Because despite all the tremendous technological advantages we've created, it seems men are still feeling that deep void and are feeling a sense of meaninglessness. A meaninglessness that's contributing to a malaise in these three categories. Education, male friendships, and romantic relationships. According to the Brookings Institute, college enrollment is falling mostly among men. Women graduate high school and college at higher rates. Women get the majority of all degree types. And because I'm also a tribal human being who is also capable of schadenfreude, I'm aware there may be some feminists who may think, hell yeah, men have earned unfair advantages because of their birth. Now it's the women's turn to reap some benefits. All I can say is, if that's what comes to mind to you, or some people you know when these statistics are widely known but not talked about, I think you or that person you know need to reevaluate some values. My whole narrative in this channel isn't that men are more fucked than women, because I don't think anyone could possibly know who is more fucked on a mass scale. My whole thing is both men and women are fucked in today's hypermodern culture. The problem that I want to shed light on is that for some reason, men's fuckedness are not being paid attention to nearly as much as women's. According to Cigna Health Insurance, 61% of Americans report feeling lonely, with men feeling lonelier than women. Survey Center of American Life, nearly one in five American men admit not to having a single close friend. NPR, referencing Cigna's loneliness studies, loneliness appeared to be more common among men. They found 63% of men to be lonely, compared with 58% of women. And trust me, I'm not saying this to make men seem like the victim of these trends, because it's not just men that are the victims, but all of us, especially for our children, the Zoomers. While Gen Z had the highest average loneliness score, about 50%, and boomers having the lowest, about 43%, according to APA, they are the least mentally formidable of all generations, with worries like mass shooting, suicide, global warming. Nearly 4 in 10 girls, 38%, surveyed reporting having symptoms of depression. Those with the highest levels of depression, moderate to severe, quote, were more likely than girls without depressive symptoms to say that YouTube, Instagram, and messaging apps have had had a mostly negative impact on people their age. It's times like these we have to ask ourselves, is there any role model that can help us to aspire to our best self 
A man that's had it worse and still made society better off? Among the short list of historical figures, few would argue that one man is easily the MVP of that all too short short list. A man by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche. Friedrich Nietzsche was so controversial, so complex, and so contradictory that many people to this day have no idea whether he was just trolling for views or whether even he himself believed the things he wrote. But even though most surface level readers might think of him dangerous or even repulsive, any scholar today will tell you we would all be stuck in the philosophical dark ages, trapped in mass scale nihilism and meaninglessness. It's because of him we've made tremendous strides in feminism, even though he was accused of being a sexist. Individuality over nationalism, fascism, socialism, communism, you name it. He transformed the necessity of beauty, psychology being a mainstay for people like Sigmund Freud, Carl Jung, Alfred Adler, Abraham Maslow, and many more. Nietzsche not only changed the way we view the world, but he completely changed the way we viewed the human potential itself. So it's times like these I ask, what would, what would Nietzsche do if he lived in today's society? I think this is a much more profound question than it seems because, well, people today like to say we're living in the greatest technological change in history or this is the era of innovation and growth. But what if I told you that if there was a social change award, the prize would actually go to Nietzsche's generation? Let's go through all the things that occurred during his lifetime, shall we? At a social level, the American Civil War, 1861-65, to 65, the Franco-Prussian War, 1870 to 71. Charles Darwin's Theory of Evolution gets published on The Origin of Species, 1859. Oh yeah, the rise of nationalism and imperialism in Europe, which, you know, led to World War I. Oh, and what about technological change? I don't know, the Industrial Revolution, which gave us the ability to harness water via the water wheel, the spinning jenny, which gave us the ability to make clothes en masse, the steam engine, which gave us steamboats and steamships, they harnessed electricity, which gave us generators and electric motors, railways and subways, the telegraph, and yeah, the automobile. Now, it's obvious there's tremendous progress today as well, both technologically and socially. Fusion, AI, electric vehicles, this thing. But it's really hard for our generation to not just adjust, but to question whether all of these things these amazing things are actually making us think less for ourselves, that these things are actually making us soft and too comfortable. This is exactly what Nietzsche thought about his generation's innovations. Quote, the industrial revolution has led to the triumph of quantity over quality, resulting in a society of mass produced goods and thoughtless conformity. And the industrial revolution has reduced the strength of individual men and made them interchangeable parts of a machine. It was because of his generation's tremendous technological change, the geopolitical wars, and the changing societal norms. It was these things, coupled with the fact that he had neurosyphilis, which gave him migraines so bad he was prone to vomiting from the pain alone. It was also reported he would go days without eating a proper meal because his medicinal cocktails of opium, bromide, and probably gasoline or something. He endured all of these things to end up catatonic after a nervous breakdown and was essentially brain dead for a few years before a relatively young death at 55. Now, when I pretentiously put myself in Nietzsche's Air Jordan loafers, again, I ask, what would n do about his suffering and the breakneck change of his time? I think he would say, bro, it sucked, but I love the shit out of it. You see, during his relatively short lifespan, he would go on to create countless volumes of astute observations, predictions, and ideas that would go on to change the course of history beyond recognition. To talk about all of his ideas would most likely take a bazillion hours of content and a doctorate's degree in existentialist philosophy, but in this video of how men can be more formidable in the three realms I talked about, we'll be going over just two of his ideas that helped him during his time and I think could help us fight this modern male malaise we're all facing today. Amor fati is a Latin phrase that means love of fate, and it implies that individuals should embrace their fate and accept everything that happens to them as part of their destiny. According to Nietzsche, the concept of amor fati involves a complete affirmation of life, including all of its sorrows and its joys, successes and failures, triumphs 
and tragedies. Nietzsche believed that individuals who embrace their fate in this way are able to overcome the pessimism and nihilism that can arise when confronted with the inherent difficulties and suffering of life. Nietzsche saw Amor Fati as a way to cultivate a sense of inner strength, resilience, and joy even in the face of adversity. He believed that by accepting our fate, we are able to find meaning and purpose in our lives, and that this acceptance of fate allows us to live in the present moment rather than dwelling on past regrets and future anxieties. But you see, this isn't the whole picture with Nietzsche. He never advocated for a life of hedonism or aimlessness, for example. He advocated for loving the life of extreme self-possession and relentless attempts for self-mastery through an expression of what he called will to power. The will to power is a central concept in the philosophy of Nietzsche. It refers to the fundamental drive or instinct that underlies all human behavior. According to Nietzsche, all living things, including humans, have a natural desire to exert their power over others and over their environment. He believed the will to power was a driving force behind human creativity, ambition, and achievement, as well as all the source of conflict in human societies. He saw the will to power as a natural and essential aspect of human nature and believed that individual who were able to channel this instinct towards positive goals could achieve greatness and self-mastery. Nietzsche's concept of will to power reflects his belief in the importance of personal agency and self-determination. When he first mentioned will to power and amor fati, it was in the book he was possibly most proud of, saying it was, quote, the highest book there is. This book is called Thus Spoke Zarathustra. In it, he says, my formula for greatness in a human being is amor fati, that one wants nothing to be different, not forward, not backward, not in all eternity, not merely bear what is necessary, still less conceal it. All idealism is mendacity in the face of what is necessary, but love it. What he's saying here is if men love their shitty shit food, their loneliness, and their virtual games, then more power to them. But in light of a formula for greatness, their life is not one of power, power meaning self-overcoming, but of idealism, an idealism he called herd mentality. You see, Nietzsche saw what he called, quote, the death of God as a new period when the church and politics were becoming more and more fanatical, when pleasure was the highest good, when identifying with emotions instead of reason was the main method for critical thinking, when his fellow Europeans were slandering faith and hope with nationalism and identitarian politics. These things sound familiar? If it doesn't, rewind what I said and realize I wasn't just talking about 1857. I was talking about today, too. It's for this reason Nietzsche is such an influential figure in history, because he was able to see four generations into the future and saw there will come a time when masses of men and women were going to vehemently despise the elites, when people were going to uphold ideas of weakness and pity over hard work and suffering for a purpose. He understood that as progress increases and times become more utopian, men were going to be forced into ideological boxes. Woke, conservative, black pill, red pill. Nietzsche saw the death of a mass institution like Christianity would leave a hole in our sense of belonging and men would face a crisis of comfort that will result in us killing the part of ourselves that wants to excel and be a master of self, all for the sake of acceptance in the status quo. Nietzsche thought the reason we conformed was to fit into a group because doing this made our lives easier. And if there's one thing Nietzsche hated more than anything, well, besides everything, was mass conformity. He thought that at the root of conformity was our necessity to shy away from reality and suffering. What he understood, however, was that it doesn't kill you, makes you stronger. But in order to be stronger, you have to face what he called the abyss, the void of nothingness, nihilism, existential angst. He thought the worst thing to do in life was for a man to bemoan his fate and wish to change his fate. He thought more than anything, men should find their own values, to identify with their own power through their values, not just to identify with their power and values. But much more importantly than that, he thought men should identify with that process that led them to gain their power. That process is your will to power. Your will to self-mastery and outer mastery as a byproduct. The will to power, he said, thus interpreted, is not a psychological concept but a metaphysical one, signifying that primal force which manifests itself through the universe both in the inorganic and organic realm, and which appears to us as will. Amor Fati and the idea of will to power cannot be without the other. If you want to master yourself or a craft or even those around you, which I don't recommend, you have to start off with the idea that suffering and discomfort is a part of life 
and that you should love the suffering of life the same way a sagely father looks at his child's crooked ass teeth. Sure, it's ugly to look at. You hope it changes, but all in all, you still love the fuck out of this thing. And the same thing goes for your loving of faith. If you want to love the suffering of life, then suffer for something. If you're a programmer who loves making code, if you're a guy working out twice a day, if you're a routine stickler, if you're a student, if you're a man that aims for greatness by any means, there is a lot of suffering and sacrifices you decided to go through to attain excellence. You decided to suffer for something, will to power, and you decided to love it, amor fati, for the sake of getting good at that thing, which is to say, you found meaning in suffering. Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl, who was heavily influenced by Nietzsche and his existentialist philosophy, said that the only thing that got him to survive a cruel concentration camp and the brutality of his fellow men was the idea that, quote, suffering ceases to be suffering in the same way in the moment that it finds a meaning. I think there's a male malaise today, not because it's anyone's fault, but when there's porn and a potential date literally at our fingertips, who needs to strive for self-mastery for the sake of potential mates? When there are countless videos on YouTube and other websites like Udemy and Coursera, who needs school? With 94% of game addicts primarily being men, thus providing a false sense of male bonding, who needs a brotherhood? Well, in friendship, Nietzsche would say, friendship is a horizon which expands indefinitely. In education, he would say, the goal of education is not to increase knowledge, but to create possibilities for a child to invent and discover, to create men who are capable of doing new things. In romantic relationships and friendships in general, he would say, love is not a feeling of happiness. Love is a willingness to sacrifice. I know these are things he would say, not only because they are aligned with his vast philosophy, but because these are things he actually said. So this is to the men watching this video. When you finish this video, don't let the next one autoplay. Pause this video when it ends and set a five minute timer and ask yourself, but I mean actually ask yourself, what do I wish was different about myself? What do I wish about myself was better. And this could be to have a girlfriend or a boyfriend. It could be to make more money, to get more fit, to go back to school, to stop masturbating or playing video games, whatever. After you found an answer about something you wish you could change about yourself, think about the pain and discomfort it will take to change and realize it's possible to love the pain that gets you to achieving that change. To love the pain of waking up at the soulless crack of moonlight to drive to the gym. To love the pain of putting your phone away when you know you want to watch porn to love the pain of disconnecting your console or uninstalling your computer games. It's possible to love the gut-wrenching, nerve-wracking embarrassment of making conversation with your barista, gym-goer, classmate, or whoever. It's possible to embrace that discomfort by telling yourself, I look forward to discomfort because I know that if I can master myself through will, I'll attain the ultimate superpower, the superpower of self-discipline and existential formidableness. I'm not afraid of